The Covenant Podcast exists to discuss doctrine, theology, and the biblical worldview from a covenantal Baptist perspective. We pray that this resource will be edifying to you and glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast here. Austin here with my co-host, Jimmy Johnson. This episode, we have the privilege of having Jay Ryan Davidson as our guest. Uh, Ryan is here to talk about the subject of his book, Green Pastures, a primer on the ordinary means of grace. He is a pastor, husband, father, professor, and PhD candidate at the Free University of Amsterdam. Uh, Welcome back onto the podcast, Ryan. Thanks, guys, so much for having me. Ryan, we're we're going to be talking about, I believe it's your newest book, Green Pastures, a little bit in our in our episode, and particularly the means of grace. So, could you just start off by telling us why you wrote the book Green Pastures and what exactly you mean by the title? Absolutely. Um, well, I think it's an important topic, uh, particularly for many of us who grew up in uh, broad evangelical or Southern Baptist churches and were not familiar with this term. Um, What caused me to uh, write the book was that uh, several years ago, I led our church through a summer sermon series dealing with the means of grace. And um, the book kind of comes out of that sermon series. Uh, It's really just a introductory look exegetically, uh, through the the means of grace, and when we say means of grace, we mean um, the uh, the means or mechanisms, the channels through which the Lord uh, ministers His grace to His people. And um, the ordinary means of grace are those things which we see in Scripture that are uh, ordinarily uh, given to um, uh, to His people. Uh, and that that come with the promise of blessing. So we may say, uh, reading a Christian blog, talking to some brothers on a podcast, these may be means that the Lord uses to strengthen our faith, but they're not the ordinary means. The ordinary means are uh, preaching, prayer, and the sacraments. And so I just wanted to lead our congregation through that. And the title of the book uh, really kind of comes from Psalm 23, you know, that the Lord uh, leads us in uh, green pastures. And so as uh, members of the new covenant, he leads us as his sheep in the green pastures of of these means of grace. Hmm. Um, this question was uh, originally Jimmy's question, and uh, Jimmy was uh, a student at RTS whenever he first heard the term ordinary means of grace. So uh, what are the reasons the ordinary means of grace have lost emphasis among Christians and churches? And what do you believe has replaced them in some circles? Great question. Yeah, um, I think, uh, well, my personal opinion is that um, uh, Protestants in the West, but specifically Baptists, um, and we'll add to that for this discussion, uh, broad evangelicals, non-denominational uh, adherents, um, got away in the 1800s and early 1900s from robust um, confessional documents. And as such, we tended to rally around uh, a few core teachings, which were true and good, but we lost um, we lost an emphasis on things like the means of grace. And then as revivalism uh, kind of came in and other kinds of uh, methodologies, we began to focus on other things, um, doing things to get people to pray a prayer, uh, to walk an aisle. And um, thus our church services began to be more focused towards unbelievers than believers. Now, don't get me wrong. I think we should proclaim the gospel to unbelievers every Lord's Day. But the worship of God's people on the Lord's Day is for believers first. And we sort of lost sight of that, and we replaced it with, quite frankly, uh, gimmicks, uh, kind of sensational types of uh, 
things uh, in our services. And so people began to value less the Lord's Supper. Baptism became something that you do just to celebrate someone getting saved in a Baptist church. And preaching increasingly became minimized for other kinds of things. Uh, and so it's one man's opinion, but I think those are some of the reasons why, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, if you ask the average Baptist or evangelical, what are the means that the Lord uses ordinarily to, to grow you in his grace? They, they probably would not say what the scripture actually says about the means of grace. Yeah. I, I think that's that's well put, and I would agree with most of what you said there. Well, all of what you said there, I think that is true. Um, in your book, you you kind of give a brief exposition of each one of the means of grace that you listed earlier. Could you give an even briefer synopsis of those means of grace, defining what they are, and then and then just kind of giving us a little bit of how they work as means of grace? Sure. Um, So I I think, and I'm I'm, I'm aided here by um, Jim Renahan's succinct treatment of this when he says that the ordinary means of grace, and I think he's right, they are those things which Christ instituted for his church. And they are things not only that he instituted, but that come uh, with uh, a blessing attached to them, the promise of blessing. Now, this is not the idea that these things in and of themselves will always bless people. You know, anytime we can uh, immerse someone in water, uh, no matter whether they're a believer or not, we're going to be blessed. Now, what what we mean here is that when these things are attended to by faith, uh, then we uh, assume that there's going to be uh, the, the blessing that comes from the Lord Christ. And so when we say ordinary means, as I mentioned earlier, uh, first we have the preaching of the word. Um, You know, Acts 20, verse 32, uh, among other things, points to the idea that in the preaching of the word, uh, the Lord grows his people. The London Baptist Confession of Faith says that it is through the preaching of the word that uh, people are converted and that they are furthered in the faith. Um, It also says, uh, I believe in um, chapter 14, paragraph one, it speaks of uh, the sacraments and prayer also being uh, a means that are used to strengthen and increase the faith of uh, believers. And so as we walk through these, uh, we could see, uh, it's hard to make this uh, short, we could see, for instance, in Ephesians 2, uh, in preaching, uh, that Christ um, says, uh, you know, that Paul says of Jesus that he came and preached peace to the Ephesian believers. Well, Jesus never went to Ephesus. And so from this idea, we get the understanding that the preaching of the word of Christ through Christ's ordained ministers, first his apostles and then elders and pastors down through the ages, is the word of Christ to the people of Christ. And that just changes our view of preaching. Preaching is no longer uh, something that we Hope will be an encouragement to us, uh, a great motivational speech. But it's actually when uh, done in accordance with God's word, it's actually Christ's words to his people, uh, which changes our understanding of it. Similarly, the sacraments are the words of God's covenant promises made visible to our eyes. So baptism is not just the celebration that someone has trusted Christ. Baptism is a sermon, if you will. That, that God proclaims for all of the congregation to see. And it's not just for the individual being baptized. So every time I tell our people at our church, every time there's a baptism, we get to see with our eyes visibly the proclamation of the word of God's covenant of grace. We say the same thing about the Lord's Supper. In the book, I, I kind of walk through several texts, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, uh, among others, and the idea that the Lord's Supper is not just a memorial. It's not just an opportunity for us to think about Jesus, although it is that. It is, in addition to that, it's uh, a time where God's people spiritually have fellowship and communion with Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God. And so um, these uh, sacraments are visible signs that are used to proclaim his covenant promise. And then prayer, I believe a, a text that I walk through in the book, First John 5, we look at how prayer um, is not just talking to God. 
but it's uh, bearing our soul to the Lord uh, and receiving promises as we do through his word. Uh, And these are means that he uses uh, preaching, sacraments, and prayer to nourish our faith, to strengthen us. Um, And I'll just lastly, I'll say this. In so many churches, these are the very things that we're minimizing in a time when these are the very things that we see in the word that we need. Hmm. Ryan, uh, before I ask this next question, I just uh, want to say that Jimmy and I are also pastors. And uh, I know that for me personally, uh, I would like to emphasize the ordinances as a means of grace in our congregation. And probably I would say that, um, my church historically has viewed the Lord's Supper as a uh, memorial view instead of a means of grace view. So for me, uh, as we ask this question on the Lord's Supper, keep in mind how I, as a pastor, can help introduce my congregation to the means of grace view. Uh, And you already answered this question a little bit in the last answer, but you alluded to the spiritual presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Uh, can you flesh out those who haven't heard of this and why is it important to understand the Lord's Supper as more than just a memorial view? Absolutely. Uh, great question, brother. And I, I think, firstly, let me say um, in the book, I talk about this some, but um, you know, I'm very comfortable uh, using the words uh, ordinance and sacrament interchangeably. Now, part of my, you know, uh, Comfort with that, it it came with um, studying it, but also proclaiming kind of to our people. We at our church, uh, I like you, you guys both, I'm a pastor and trying to lead people. And when you hear the word sacrament in a Baptist church, you begin to think, okay, are we, are we uh, going Roman Catholic here? And, um, and so part of the education for our people was just understanding what those two words meant and that they are essentially interchangeable words by ordinance, you know, that which Christ ordains. Um, And so when I think about the Lord's Supper, when we look at the scriptures, we should boldly say that the scriptures proclaim that the Lord's Supper is a memorial. It is a time to uh, remember what Christ has done. He says, he he tells us to do that, uh, 1 Corinthians 11. But in 1 Corinthians 10, we read that uh, Paul, in the midst of discussing uh, the issue of idolatry, uh, points the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 16 to the, the Lord's Supper. And he says, this bread that we break, is it not a communion in the body of Christ? In the body of Christ? This cup that we bless, is it not a communion or a fellowship of the blood of Christ? Now, growing up, if you had asked me to read that, I probably would have said what Paul is talking about here is uh, communion with each other. When we come to the Lord's Supper, look, the whole church is gathered here. We're getting along. We all love Jesus. We're having fellowship. And that is true. But if we look closely at that particular text, Paul says that we're participating in the Lord's Supper in a fellowship with the physical body of Christ. Now, we know what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean that Christ is being crucified again. He doesn't mean that the bread and the wine have literally become the body and blood of Christ, because that would not square with other passages of Scripture. But what we what we begin to see is that just as he says, don't go to the uh, idolatrous feasts because you're participating with demons, when you come to the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 10, you're participating with Christ. And so there is the sense in which Christ is feeding his people and we're spiritually present with him, right? And again, this gets, this is a little bit technical because when we talk about Christ being fully God and fully man, he has a physical body and his physical body is not everywhere at the same time. Um, And yet he is the omnipresent second person of the Trinity. And so there's some theology involved there. But when Paul says we have fellowship with Christ, I I think it's clear from the text that what he means is, By his spirit, when we come in faith, we have a unique fellowship with Christ. So it is more than just remembering him. It's also being present with him by the spirit in a unique way. Well put. This next question is 
it seems pretty simple and straightforward and 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 I assume we'll agree on the answer to it but with the existence of of several parachurch ministries and things like that I I think it's necessary to ask when and where do Christians partake of the means of grace Great question brother uh I mean I, I'll cut to the chase I think the chief place that we participate in the means of grace is with the church gathered on the Lord's Day or the Sabbath. Um, And that doesn't mean that the uh, listening to sermons throughout the week or reading our Bible or prayer are not things that we can also do individually. But I think you see a corporate nature of the body being gathered on the Lord's Day with Christ present among them. You know, Revelation chapter 1 pictures Christ standing among his churches. He's present with us. And he nurtures and feeds us through the proclamation of his word, uh, through preaching and through his word made visible in the ordinances or sacraments. And then as we respond in prayer to him. And then, yes, secondarily, we take that out into our Monday through Saturday um, experience. So I would not be an advocate of, uh, quite frankly, what I was a participant in occasionally in college. You know, a group of students getting together after a Tuesday night worship a praise and worship session and having the Lord's Supper. Uh, in some sense, our heart might have been in the right place, but the Lord's Supper, baptism, these are ordinances, these are sacraments for the for the local church. And so um, we need to uh, understand that the means of grace flow out of the local church, specifically gathered on the Lord's Day. Uh, and then certainly from there, reading my Bible, listening to sermons, uh, those are helpful things throughout the week. Uh, but the chief location, the primary location, is the Lord's Day gathering of His people. What practical ramifications do the means of grace have on the Christian life and the ministry of the local church? I think, brother, these are, uh, well, there are a lot. Um, I think first, they, when we understand the rhythm, I talk about this in the book, the Lord gives us, I kind of liken it to, uh, I think, uh, basically livestock that, you know, you, the Lord gives us, uh, a rhythm that we're fed in. He gives us a food and he fences us in with his local church. Um, and I kind of use that as an analogy. Uh, so I, I, I think firstly, a practical ramification is our own growth. We begin to rightly come to the Lord through the means that he has said he will use. Um, And I know that sounds kind of nebulous, but I think that's the the first chief ramification. But then secondarily, I think whole churches can be transformed in their understanding, their ethos, if you will, of how to operate when the body begins to realize the primacy of preaching and baptism and the Lord's Supper and prayer. But, you know, there are secondary ramifications that are practical. You know, I often note either to myself or sometimes uh, publicly um, that when the church gathers around the Lord's table, there is uh, uh, a a reality of seeing the body, people from various socioeconomic statuses, uh, ethnicities, problems, problems. You know, some come with great joys that week, some come with great sorrows, and we're all gathered there. And there is a a practical ramification of unity that can come from that. Um, You know, I also uh, spend a lot of time in counseling. That's kind of one of the things that uh, I've spent a lot of time in. And I often talk to people who are wrestling with assurance or with depression or with anxiety. And uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, oddly enough, actually becomes something that I point them to. And in in the midst of their depression or their anxiety, Christ bids them to come to his table. Even that person, a person who is depressed and doesn't want to be, a person who's worried and doesn't want to be, is invited to come to the table of the Lord. And so I think they become uh, very practical things um, in addition to the rich foundation of, uh, of our food as well. I don't know if that fully answers your question. Those are just some examples. No, I think those are 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 really good examples and and very helpful. Um, 
aside from your own book, which I would recommend in that it's it's very accessible and, and gives a good primer, as it's called, on, on the subject, but what are some other resources that you would recommend for people that that are more curious about this, whether it be a pastor that's wanting to get more into the nitty gritty and technical details, or just a lay person who's wanting to get more information about this so that they might prepare themselves for worship on the Lord's day and to receive the ordinary means of grace. Absolutely. Um, Well, I think there are books on the various uh, individual means, um, but you know, as we would say, books on preaching, books on prayer. Um, but uh, for some modern examples, um, you know, uh, Richard Barcelos has a great book on the Lord's Supper, More Than a Memory. I think that's uh, that's a very helpful book. I tell people if, if, if they're not necessarily looking for um, an ultra simplified version, read that before you read anything I've written. It's very, very helpful. Um, and then I think, honestly, just reading people from generations past. I mean, just getting a good systematic theology uh, like Burkhoff or picking up uh, Bavink. Now I realize some people listening to this might, might think, Oh, those are too, those are too academic or too wordy for me. But um, there are some great Puritan resources, even Puritan paper batch that banner of truth puts out that kind of discuss these things. And if you, if you do a survey, you'll begin to realize what we're talking about here is not new. It's actually strange that it's gone gone out of our vocabulary for a while, um, and uh, so those those would be some initial uh, resources. Just reading the chapter on, um, you know, sacraments or ordinances in any number of good systematic theologies would be a great place to start. I know that sounds overly academic, and if any of your listeners are sitting there thinking, "Well, I'm not a seminary student. I'm not a pastor." That's okay. There are some good resources that you don't have to fully read every page of to kind of grasp this concept. And then in the book, I think in some footnotes, I list uh, a variety of uh, you know resources uh, that might be helpful uh, in in thinking about this more fully. Ryan, we're thankful for uh, this discussion today. Do you have any final encouragements for pastors and lay people alike on? Uh, giving themselves to the ordinary means of grace? Um, Yes, a couple, actually. Uh, The first I would say is uh, to prayerfully consider the text um, themselves uh, and to to prayerfully, um, uh, well, quite frankly, uh, study it and then also maybe spend some time uh, in, in repentance for, any lost years uh, where they may not have, uh, you know, rightly understood those or utilized those. Uh, And then um, spend time in Thanksgiving that God has, has shown, well, there are some simple things that God, the the Lord Christ who loves me is given to me. And then as leaders of churches, as pastors, I would then say, don't, don't be afraid to take the long view with your people. You know, some people listening to this podcast they're fully convinced. Maybe they've read my little book or they've read something bigger and better than that. And they're, and they're just convinced and they just want their whole church to grasp this right away. And I would just caution from um, not bringing your people along. I would just caution, you know, just lovingly, maybe, maybe it's a sermon series. Maybe it's uh, preaching exegetically, expositionally through a book of scripture like first Corinthians and letting these things naturally come from the text and spending the next two to three years um, just trying to, in from the pulpit and one-on-one conversations, putting good books in people's hands um, to, to, to bring their people along. Um, I've, uh, in my work on this subject and then the Lord's Supper, I've, I've, I've talked to quite a few folks and a lot of folks in our circles, meaning Reformed Baptist circles, are really, I guess, falling in love with the Lord's Supper again, which is great. But I'll hear some people say, I really want our church to do it every week. And and that's great. I'm, I'm all for that. But I would just caution moving so quickly that your people don't actually, as they move with you, see and appreciate the means of grace for what they are. Um, and uh, there's no sense in increasing the regularity of uh, of the Lord's Supper if Every time people come, it's nothing more than 
just what it's been before. And so, uh, and then the last thing that I would say, brothers, is as uh, as our brothers who hear this, who are leading churches, uh, find themselves discouraged in churches, uh, maybe where people are resistant to this. Um, in God's providence, my church was not. But if if you are uh, in your in your church, um, just just love love your people and trust that God, uh, through your willingness to continue to be faithful to the Word and yet to gently love your people, that God w- will will have His way among them. And so, don't get discouraged. God is God is not unaware of um, your church's need to grow a greater appreciation for these things. Uh, so, those are some just general thoughts that I would have. Ryan, I just want to thank you for taking time to come on the Covenant podcast and also for writing your your helpful book. Well, you're certainly welcome, guys. It's a privilege to be here with you guys again, and thanks so much for the work you're doing. Well, and as usual, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. CBTS exists to provide ministerial training in the context of a confessional local church. They are, among other things, confessional, Baptist, affordable, accessible, and accredited. You can learn more about them by listening to our previous episode with Rex or visiting their website at cbtseminary.org. Again, that is cbtseminary.org. Thank you for listening to The Covenant Podcast. If you've enjoyed this resource or you simply like The Covenant Podcast, head on over to our iTunes page, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are also available via Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and Podbean. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.